Right, today I'm pretty much going to be preaching from Romans 8, uh, and I was reading through this passage, and the title of my sermon today is Comforting Truths in Hard Times. So in Romans 8 here, there, I believe there are three truths in here um, that are offering comfort to Christians when we go through hard times. So we'll read through them, and I'll, I'll cover the points as we go through them. So let's just read from Romans 8, and I'll start reading from verse 18. This is the first one. And maybe as I read this passage, you may uh, recognize these different truths as I go through them. But today, I'm going to go through three comforting truths. Uh, <coughs> three comforting truths uh, to the Christian in hard times. All right, Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God, <coughs> Excuse me. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So the first one I want to talk about is <clears throat> in Romans 8 is life is short. Now how is that comforting? Well, we'll talk about it in a moment. But my first comforting truth in hard times is that life is short. And really what this passage is talking about here up until verse 25, he's talking about really uh, like physical ailment. If you think about physical sickness or disability or even physical persecution, which is often what Paul is writing about, right? Because they're getting persecuted and beaten and whipped and chased and all that sort of thing. So in here, he's talking about that suffering that we suffer in this body. And that's why as we read through it, it talks about our body. It groans and travails in pain. And we're waiting for one day to get that new body that doesn't have any pain, doesn't have any suffering, right? Because right now, as when we're saved, we're just saved spiritually, right? We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We get that new creature. But then that creature, like it says here, it's subject to vanity in the sense that we're still connected to a sinful body and this sinful body has aches and pains and obviously suffers persecution in here but one day we're going to get the adoption which is what the redemption of our body when jesus um, you know he comes again and we're going to be changed in the moment uh, in the twinkling of an eye so why is this a comforting thing you know that 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 life is short because people that are going through physical sickness they have a disability. Maybe they had an injury where they're, they're going through hard times. And, you know, and, and unfortunately, this is something that I can only sympathize with because, you know, thank God I've got my health. You know, I don't have any severe disability. But for those of you who know me, sometimes I do suffer from really bad eczema. Like Michael's seen it when it's really bad. I remember I was at Lighthouse and I just had sores all over my body. And oh, it, it's just a terrible thing. Like sometimes when you have really bad eczema, and you're just itchy all over. It just makes you think back to Job like how he had those boils and I just feel, I really feel for the guy, right? So it's times like this when you're going through these, why is it a comforting truth that life is short? Why? Because it's not going to last forever, right? Life is so quick that even though you go through really hard times in this life, and I'm, I obviously I, I can't always empathize with every single sickness and every single disability, but because life is short, we know, hey, this is not going to last forever. You know, this life is but a moment. And that's why he says here in, in Romans 8, 18, for I reckon, see, he's saying, I, I think, this is my opinion, right? That the sufferings of this present time, look at this, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So he's saying, what is he saying here? The stuff that you're going to suffer from, the illness, the disability, the persecution that you suffer in this body, it's not even worthy to even compare them right he is he's, it's kind of a bit of an oxymoron here because he does compare them but then he's saying you know the what you go through here when you get that new body when you are resurrected it, it's not it, you're not even going to think about all this suffering that you went through right and it says here i reckon that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, and we see this same thought again. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What is he talking about here? The fact that they're out preaching the gospel, this treasure of the gospel as they're going out, you know, the, the gospel's hid to them that are lost. In, er, in an earthen vessel, what is your body, right? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So what is he saying? We have the word of God that we're preaching. It's in an earthen vessel, but all the great deeds that get done, God gets the glory, right? Because we're in a, we're in a, a, a sinful body that's doing these things as we go out and preach the gospel and whatnot. <laughs> Look at this, we are troubled on every side. So this is the physical persecution, the actual context of this passage that Paul is talking about. Yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. So if you think about what Jesus went through, this is what they're going through, right? They're saying they go through this life, they're being persecuted, just like when Jesus Christ was beaten and punished and and, 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 and suffered for us. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. So that gives you an idea of the sort of things Paul is going through. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. <coughs> so then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith as according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes. What is Paul saying here? The reason why he goes through all these things is so that he can preach the gospel and minister to these people in the Corinthian church. That the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. That's the ultimate goal, right? For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, right? This is the physical body, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Look at this. For our light... Affliction. Now let's just stop there for a moment. We just read through that, the persecution, the beating, all the things that he was going through, right? The death, the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how does Paul describe that? He says, for our light affliction. Right? Does that sound like light affliction? No, right? Because he's got the right perspective. For our light affliction compared to what? Which is, but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, temporary, right? But the things which are not seen are eternal. So you see here as Paul's going through this physical persecution, what's a comforting truth to him? The fact that it's light affliction? Why? Because it's but for a moment. Life is short, even if you're going through the hardest of times, because life is short, you know it's going to be over very soon compared to eternity. And he even says here, it works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, right? Because as you go through suffering here, you are earning rewards in heaven. But life is really short. Let's just go to a very familiar passage to us and be reminded again in James 4.13. Go to now ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And you know, a lot of these, uh, these hard times that I'm going to be talking about today, maybe you all are not going through all these. You know, I know, I, I know quite intimately you guys' <laughs> lives and things like that. Maybe you are. Maybe there are things you haven't shared with people. So hopefully this is comforting to you. But at the same time, you know, think about these comforting truths because oftentimes you'll have an opportunity to comfort somebody else. And I have often gone to these passages reminding people that life is short for people that are going through really hard times, like really hard physical disability, you know, they, they've had surgeries and they're going through pain and, you know, life is just really hard for them. And sometimes they just need to have their mind renewed and their, and their, and their perspective switched again to say, hey, just, just wait a second, because in this grand scheme of eternity, life is really short. You ought to just use this little life that you have. It's not, you know, it might not be that pleasant, but it's not going to be for very long either. And of course, it feels like a long time when you're going through it. So I'm not downplaying that at all. But at the same time, this is something that can comfort somebody. They have the right perspective as they're going through that, that trial. Now, the other side of this truth, because I've got the comforting truth, but there's also the other side of it too, because life is short, there isn't that much time left 
You know, we always remind each other, hey, you know, when are you going to start taking the work of God seriously? You know, when are we going to start really doing things for God? And when are we, you know, going to think, hey, you know what, we, we do a lot of things in this life. Are we wasting our life? Because life is so short, isn't it? You know, I mean, let's, let's go to uh, 2 Peter. I want to show you this verse here. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Let's read here. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So this is talking about the end times, when everything is going to be gone, right? Everything that you've worked hard for, the houses, the boats, the cars, the motorcycles, you know, the, all the gadgets and gizmos, your business, your career, all that's going to be gone, right? It's all going to be burnt up. And then he says here in verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? What is he saying here? How should you be living your life realizing that life is short, that Jesus one day is going to come back, the, the end times is going to happen, everything's going to be burnt up, what's going to be left? You know, because oftentimes we reflect on our life and, you know, you know, people go through midlife crisis and whatnot. And really what they're thinking about is, like, what did they accomplish with their life? And, you know, I often, you know, I'm not, I'm not above these things in the sense that, you know, I, I obviously am tempted to do things and have pleasures in this life and things like that. Because I often think, hey, it would be really great. Like if, you know, uh, sometimes you, you see like people's Instagram accounts or their faces and they're traveling here and they're trying this food. Have you seen those, uh, you know, those food blogs that people do and they travel the world and they're eating all this different food? I, I always think like, I'd love to go to Japan, right? And eat in those little bars and just try all the food and everything like that. So, you know, do I, do I have those sort of temptations? Of course, like, I, that looks like fun. But then sometimes I need to be reminded, you know, is it really, is it really worth the money that I'm spending traveling, doing all these things, doing all these activities? Because in the flesh, you want to do these things, right? Because you don't want to miss out. You don't want to think like, oh, I didn't get to do that. I didn't get to do this. I didn't get to travel here or try this food. But you know what? When you get to heaven, that is, you're not going to think about that at all. Right? This is one thing you have to realize. When we get to heaven, you're not going to regret not taking that extra holiday. You're not going to regret not getting that better car or not building your business bigger. These are not the things you're going to regret when you get to heaven. What you're going to regret is the amount of work you did for God. That's what you're going to regret. You're going to regret not giving the gospel to more people that you could have. Why? Because you were spending all your life wasting your time doing vain things in this life. So yeah, you know, when you know, we have these thoughts, you know, you know, it, it could be easy just, you know, spending more time traveling. You know, you don't think, you don't think I have, like, you don't think I, I'm not like talking myself up here, but I'm just saying like, you don't think I have the potential to just like spend more time developing my career, building a business, you know, having that time, you know, if, if I didn't do the things I did for God, you know, if I didn't invest that time, no, of course, it, it, people can, right? They can do these things, but why? But the reason why we decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to spend my life serving God. I'm going to invest time into soul. I'm going to invest time studying the Bible, preparing these sermons, trying, you know, I want to be used by God to put this church together and whatnot. Why? Because we can see past these things. The Bible says here, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? So life is short. So yes, when we're going through hard times, it's a comforting truth, isn't it? Life is short. But on the, the other side as well, it kind of gets us going, doesn't it? Because we're reminded, hey, life is short. I better start serving God. Uh, Ephesians uh, 5, 14, it says here, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. What is he saying here? Wake up, guys. Wake up to the fact that you don't have much life. Right? A lot of you here are very young. We're a very young church. And when you're in your 20s and your 30s, you just think you've got your whole life ahead of you. You don't know. What if you get an illness? What if you get sick? What if you die in a car crash? What if, you know, you don't live to where you think you're going to live, you know? And even if you do, life just goes so quick. You know, life is so quick that, you know, you just think, I'm just going to, I'll get to God eventually. I'll eventually serve God. And eventually that time never comes. It says here, see, that, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. 
Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So that's number one. Number one, let's go back to Romans 8. <coughs> <coughs> number one is life is short. Life is short. That's something that'll help you get through hard times or something that you can share with somebody if they're going through hard times to say, you know what? Hey, life isn't as long as we think it is. It's a lot shorter than it is. And even though we go through hard times, it won't last forever. All right, let's look at the second one. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we uh, should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So this is of you know if if you've ever had to comfort anyone before going through hard times you know it's funny it's it, it's funny when I realised that these are all actually in Romans eight when I was thinking of these different times that I've had to sort of share with people how to comfort them, but this second one is that all things work for good. If you go back to verse twenty eight, we know that all things work together for good. Now it says here it's just not for everybody, right? It says here we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Right? So it's them that are seeking to do God's will and trying to do the right thing. If somebody just has no regard for the will of God, they don't care about the things of God, they have the love of the world rather than the love of God. Not everything is working together for good for that person. Right? But it says here, for those of us that are saved and we're trying to do the right thing, the Bible says here, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, what's an application we can think about in this instance? Well, it might be bad decisions or mistakes, you know, either past or present, your own or others, that, that, that you may be left with the consequences. Um, you know, it may be uh, somebody that you've lost unexpected, unexpectedly, you know, somebody that's died unexpectedly and now you've been shouldered with the burden of the responsibility that they have. Um, you know, I, I'm just trying to think of different applications, but you add your own application where you go through something that either it's through fault of your own, you've made a bad financial decision, maybe you haven't taken care of your health, or maybe somebody else hasn't taken care of their health and they're not taking care of themselves and it's affecting your life. And one comforting thing for us is that we know that even though we have to go through these hard times, that we ultimately know that God can work these things for good. And what is some good that can come out of it? Often when we go through hard times, it can teach you responsibility. You know, let's say, you know, you know your mom always did everything for you, but then for one reason or another, your mom dies in a, in, a, in a tragic accident, and now you have to take care of the family and whatnot. And somebody might be bitter against God for that, but one thing we can learn from it, the Bible says we know all things work together for good. What is God trying to teach that person? Maybe there's, a, maybe there's a reason why he allowed that to happen so that they can learn some responsibility, build some resilience in their character. You know, a lot of people these days, we live in the snowflake generation where people are just offended so easily. You know, they can't do anything else. They can't do anything themselves. You know, they, they, they just balk at, you know, having to do something and do some response, do something well. They're always complaining all the time. Yeah, but when people go through hard times, it builds some character, right? It, build some, it builds some resilience so that you're not like this snowflake generation. Uh, let's look at Philippians 3. This is a great passage here where Paul is talking about <coughs> striving to, to be like Jesus, right? He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, right? We're not saved by our own works. We're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And look at this, that I may know him, right? He wants to know Jesus Christ. He wants to know, you know, how to be more like Jesus Christ. And he says here, and the power of his resurrection, 
Now that sounds great, right? How to overcome sin, living the victorious Christian life. Hey, we all want that, right? But part of knowing Jesus Christ, knowing him, is not just the power of his resurrection. It says, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now that's the side of knowing Jesus that we don't want to go through, right? We, we, we want the power of the resurrection. We want the victorious Christian life, right? We want, to, we want to be dominating the Christian life. But do we want to go through the suffering? Do we want to have fellowship with Jesus in his suffering and being made conformable unto his death? The mockery, the shame, the beating, the, the, the being ostracized, being alone, right? But... That's part of it. That's part of knowing Jesus Christ is knowing not just the good, but also the bad. You see, I can build character. Let's go to James 5.10. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Look at this. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. That's an interesting thing, right? Because when you read through the story of Job, you read through the story and you think, hey, you know, Job, yeah, he had it hard. But, it, you know, you read through that story maybe in a day or two and you think, oh, yeah, but it all worked out fine for him. It's kind of like we count them happy. But do we really understand what he went through, right? The suffering, the affliction, the patience. If we go to Job, I just want to show you here in uh, Job 23.8, we get a bit of insight to what Job was thinking when he was going through these trials and it says here behold i go forward but he is not there backward but i cannot perceive him on the left hand where he doth work but i cannot behold him he hideth himself on the right hand that i cannot see him but he knoweth the way that i take when he hath tried me i shall come forth as gold so this is why in faith we know god is working all things together for good because like what job says when he looks forward when he looks back when he looks to the left and he looks to the right, he doesn't see God. I mean, sometimes he's even to the point where he thinks God's not even there. But then that's not the truth, right? God is always there. He's always there for us. And he says here, He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So you see how suffering, you know, even the Bible says about Jesus, he was made perfect through suffering. Suffering builds character. It builds resilience. And sometimes people need to be reminded of this when they're going through hard times is, hey, what is Jesus Christ trying to teach you? Because if we go back to Romans 8, if you remember here, Romans 8, he says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. See, that's the purpose of God letting you go through these hard times because he's trying to conform you. He's trying to mold you in to the image of Jesus Christ, make you more like Jesus Christ. Now, what is another side of this? Not only are we comforted knowing that, hey, when we're allowed to go through hard times, God is molding us more into the image of Jesus Christ. He's working all things for good and we ought to have that perspective and that can often comfort us in hard times. But... Look here in 2 Corinthians 1. Another side to this truth, <coughs> in here in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3, it says here, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us, comforteth us in all our tribulation, look at this, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So not only does God allow you to go through hard times, not just to teach you something and to conform you into the image of Jesus Christ, but it's also to help you to become a counsellor to others. Because oftentimes when you go through hard times, that gives you the experience and the knowledge to help somebody else go through the same thing. Uh, think about that. You know, when you're struggling with something, aren't you more comforted by somebody that has gone through it before you rather than, than somebody that can't empathize with you at all? You know, like if, you're, if you had to go through a surgery or you, you have some disability, if you're being comforted by somebody that never has had that disability, that doesn't have the same effect as somebody who has that disability too and they're trying to comfort you. So you see, whereas if everyone who went through hard times just didn't have that mindset at all, 
then they're missing out what God is trying to give them. This, 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 I guess this jewel here that they can share with somebody else. So Paul is saying here, hey, he comforteth us in all our tribulation because Paul's going through hard times and he realizes why? That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort where we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounded by Christ. See, so the more they suffer, the more their sufferings abound, the more they're able to comfort others. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So this is how God can work, work all things for good, not just in your own life, but in other people's lives as well. So life is short. You know, suffering doesn't last forever. You know, hard times don't go on forever. Life is but a vapor, which appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. Number two is all things work for good. So we need to remember that when we go through hard times, there's a reason why we're going through it so that we can not only, uh, you know, be molded into the image of Jesus Christ, but we can help others who need comfort. And the last one, we'll go back to Romans 8, 8.31. So he said, what shall we say to these things? <coughs> Excuse me. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? So as we read through this, I mean, it sounds like he's pretty much covering everything, right? He's just saying, hey, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, look at this, he's pretty much covering everything here, nor angels, nor principalities. So this is not just our physical life, it's also things that are unseen, right? Angels, principalities, nor powers, nor things present, so things that happen now, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth nor any other creature. So I guess it's, you're not even human, right? Not even animals, right? Can separate us from the love of God. Shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the last comforting truth I have for you in hard times is you will always be saved. You know, no matter what happens in your life, good, bad, even if it's of your own doing, right? nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God, right? Nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God. Because there's, you know, there's a lot, you know, we can mess up in this life. There's a lot that other people can mess up. There's a lot that we can mess up too. But we have the comfort that no matter what happens in our life, good or bad, Jesus Christ still loves us the same yesterday, today, and forever. So eternal security really is how we know this doctrine, right? Eternal security is an amazing amazingly comfortable, uh, a comforting doctrine. And people that don't believe in eternal security, they're missing out on this, right? Because they're constantly worried. Can they lose it? You know, eternal security is not like the Pentecostals believe it. Because oftentimes when you talk to Pentecostals and you say, are you always saved? Will you ever lose salvation? You know what they say to you? Yeah, yeah I'll never lose salvation. Because what they're saying is they'll never walk away from the faith. They'll never do that sin that makes you lose salvation. No, 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 that's not eternal security. Eternal security is not the Calvinistic, you know, persevere until the end and only if you make it all the way to the end, you're safe. No, no, no. Eternal security means even if you completely botch up Christianity, you walk, you forsake Jesus Christ, you do something as terrible or as murder, even if you commit suicide, you're still saved. That's eternal security. Now, that's not saying that it's okay to do those things. Obviously, those things are an abomination to God. But eternal security is the comfort that hey, even if you completely mess up your life, you mess up Christianity, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved, you will be in heaven when you die because God will never leave you nor forsake you. This is an amazing truth. 
John 10, 28. Let's go there. Jesus says here, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. See, we're in the same hand, right? Jesus' hand is the Father's hand. This is why we will never get plucked. He says, no man, <coughs> neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Because a lot of people say, yeah, well, you can, you can walk out of Jesus' hand. It's like, no, no, you're still a man, right? You can't, you can't get yourself out of Jesus' hand either, right? So you'll never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. 1 John 5, 13. This is a great one. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I just want to show a couple of others to you that I really like. This is in Titus 1 too. It says here, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. See, I know I'm going to heaven because Jesus can't lie. God doesn't lie. So when he says I have everlasting life, I know I'm going to heaven. Why? Because he's promised it to us and let's just go to one last one first john 2 25 i love how this is phrased it says here and this is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life i don't know how he can make it any clearer this is eternal security so one comforting truth in hard times is that we know no matter what happens we're always saved but the other side of this that i want to share with you guys as well is often because we think okay we're going through hard times I'm always saved. But one thing I want you guys to reflect on and what really speaks to my heart is even if you're the cause of the trouble, you know, in the sense that, you know, we sin every day. And oftentimes, you know, us as believers, we often get back into the same sin. Right? There's really not that many sins to be told. I was talking about this with my wife. You know, we always talk nebulously about people getting back into sin. Well, there's only really so many that people that live in Australia get back into, right? It could be that, you know, you're, you're, you're getting back into fornication, right? You're fornicating and you shouldn't be fornicating. Or you're watching pornography and you shouldn't be watching pornography. Or, you know, you're, you're getting drunk and, and getting, you know, you're taking drugs or something and getting back into that. Or, you know, maybe you, you struggle with anger and you've, 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 you've railed on somebody again and you feel terrible about it. Or, um, you know, what's another one? Maybe you're lazy. You know, you've just been lazy and you can't get yourself up. And what, what happens is, what I want you to reflect on is, you know, often when those things happen, and we've all been there, you know, we've all been there when we go back into the same sin, what happens? You just feel so disgusted with yourself, don't you? You just think, especially, you know, like I, I struggled with pornography for a long time, right? Trying to get away from that. And it's like, every time it's the same with people that struggle with pornography, people that struggle with fornication, it's the same thing. When they go back to it, you just feel absolutely disgusted with yourself. And what do you start thinking? God's done with me, right? You start thinking those things when you get back into those things and you just think, God's done with me. And I don't think God wants anything to do with me, right? But then what we know from the Word of God is that we realize eternal security tells me that even when I'm in my darkest moment, even when I think, you know what, I don't, I, God doesn't want anything to do with me anymore. I, I'm completely disgusted with myself. You realize, you know what, God loves you just as much the day you were saved as you're thinking in that moment right there. And that's an amazing thing. I don't even know if I'm describing it to you guys, like what I'm feeling in my heart. But when you realize this truth, it's almost like the more sinful you get, and I'm not saying just go out and sin just to feel the love of God, but I'm saying that if you've been there and you fall into that sort of sin, it's almost like the more sinful you get, the more you realize how much God loves you. Because you do not deserve the love of God. You are completely rebelling against God. You, are, you don't even care what God it thinks until you think, I, I, can't, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't understand how God still loves me, even after I keep, keep doing the same thing again and again and again. But then we read in the Bible, He does. And this is an amazing, comforting thing when you know, you're, you're in your darkest moment and you realize, I can't believe God still loves me. I'm still saved. You know, and, and that's why it's, it's amazing when we talk to people about the gospel, we say, you, know, you, don't, you, didn't, you didn't do anything to earn God's love. How can you do anything to lose it? And it's just something that we have to think about. It's like, yeah, well, I, I couldn't do it. I didn't earn it. Right? So, so why am I in this moment where I'm thinking God doesn't love me anymore 
when I never did anything to earn it to begin with. God loves me th through his grace, through, through the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you realize that, when you, when you think about those things, these are really comforting. But the other side to it as well, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.14, I'll just end on this passage. 2 Corinthians 5.14, the Bible says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Right? The fact that we know Jesus Christ died for us, we know that we have eternal life, we know that even in our darkest moments, Jesus Christ still loves us the same, yesterday, today, and forever. That love ought to compel you to serve him. That ought to be the motivating factor. You know, not me, not me bugging you to serve God. You know, not what other people think of you. You know, what ought to motivate you to serve God is to realize how sinful you are. And even in your sinful state, God still loves you the same yesterday, today, and forever. Obviously, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that love ought to constrain you to serve him. That if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So I hope these three truths, they comfort you. You remember what they are. Number one, life is short. Right? Life is short. If you're going through hard times, it's not going to last forever. Sometimes we need to be reminded that of parents, right? You know, sometimes it's hard. Our children really, they bring the best out of us, but they also bring the worst out of us. But life is short. It's going to be over before you know it. And number two, it, all things work together for good. You know, God is going to mold you through this. Don't miss the lesson that he's teaching you when you're going through hard times. And be ready to learn because one day you might need to comfort somebody else. And the last one is no matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad you get, right, you're always going to be saved. Thank God we have that love. And I pray that that love, you know, really compels you to serve Jesus Christ. That ought to be the driving factor in our Christian life. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, Lord, we just thank you for loving us. And oftentimes, Lord, we... You know, we do come short. You know, Lord, we often get back into the same sins that we're struggling and we often doubt your love for us. So thank you for reminding us today, Lord, that nothing can separate us from your love. Sure, Lord, we'll be chastised and we'll, there'll be consequences for wrong things that we do. But Lord, it's always lovingly chastised, chastisement from you. Lord, you're doing it to mold us into a better person. Help us to not only know the power of your resurrection, but also the fellowship of your sufferings. Um, so thank you, Lord, for comforting us through your word. And pray, Lord, that your love would constrain us to, to serve you and that we should not henceforth live for ourselves, but for you who died for us. We thank you, we praise you um, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.